see the term, the day of the Lord, what do you think of? Jeff? Traditionally, I've always thought about that as the second coming of Christ. Okay. However, it seems like that's developed a little bit um, deeper than that in this lesson. All right, what are some of the specifics that are involved with the day of the Lord? What are some of the components that makes it unique? Well, devastation, number one, I would say. Devastation? And some of the things that would precede it, you know, as, as far as darkness and so forth. There's a similarity between that and the second coming as well. But anyway, it's, it's, a, it's, it's destruction of people and judgment. Okay. All right. And also the opportunity to uh, repent if they choose to do so. Okay. Anyone else? What are some other things? The day of the Lord. I think there, there's a salvation aspect involved with it as well, too. What do you mean by salvation? Well, if you're thinking of the day of the Lord in terms of the second coming of Christ, and that's I, I throw that out there as an if, um, the second coming of Christ is the end of the world as we know it in terms of the opportunity for salvation or lack thereof. Matter of fact, uh, the opportunity for salvation actually is over uh, previous to that coming of Christ to, to a, a, a certain degree. So, um, uh, but anyhow, um, I think we all are looking forward to salvation and we see the event of the second coming as the climactic fulfillment of that wonderful hope that, that, uh, that we have as we read the scriptures. Can we agree for sure on one thing as we start? Is that the day of the Lord, and I'm just going to put day here, but the day of the Lord is a transitional point. So whether you consider it the second coming, the third coming, or times prior to us, days of the Lord that happened in Old Testament times, because as you look at the description of the day of the Lord, to one degree or another, it's happened already different times, and certainly has the final fulfillment in a future time. But the day of the Lord is a dividing event. It's going to end certain events. It's going to bring on a new age. But depending on which one you're looking at and how you're looking at it, because many things in Scripture uh, are not just uh, one-time events, but they're used symbolically to represent other things. For example... Uh, you can have a, a one-time event that is mimicked in day-to-day -day experiences or occasional experiences. And so God will use the occasional experience to symbolize the one-time event. Because we haven't come to the one-time event yet. And so to help us understand that event, He will say, well, it's like this. So like this event that you experience you're going to have a greater one eventually. And so it is true, the day of the Lord is used to reference numerous times in Scripture or numerous times in history, but it doesn't mean that it's only one event. Now, we'll get into that a little more as we go. Yes? So uh, a day of the Lord for me could be a day that... Uh, that Daughters and I were in trouble, and he miraculously pulled us out of it. That's uh, that was a day. That was a miracle that the Lord performed for me on that day. So that would be a day, a day of the Lord for me, as I can look forward to more days like that in the final day when He's going to perform the greatest miracle of all. It's symbolic of of the greatest one, the eventual one. Absolutely. Because there's parallels between them. And so we can have, you might say, many days of the Lord, many and many, because of the fact that they symbolize, those events are similar. Uh, for example, how many of you were raised Christians? 
Okay? Some of you were not. If you were not raised a Christian and, and some time period in your life you heard about it and you started studying it and listening to it and then you accepted God, is that the only time you gave your heart to God? Is that the only time? Yes. Is that the only time? Well, when else did you do it? Hopefully every day. Every day. Hopefully. Hopefully every day. Yeah. You see? So the daily experience of surrender has correlation with the initial. And the initial has correlation with the daily. Ellen White is very clear in Steps to Christ. How do we continue in a good relationship with God? She says, just like you came to him the first time. Surrender to him. If you want to stay in relationship with God, then do what you did the first moment you surrendered. Give yourself to him. Surrender to him. And just stay in that and repeat that. And that's how you stay in relationship. So in a sense, we may have little elements of the day of the Lord regularly. But let's, let's move on. Let's look at something bigger that God was talking about. Not the little day-by-day -day days of the Lord, but some bigger events that took place. Now, in our memory text, it says, The Lord will be awesome to them. For he will reduce to nothing all the gods of the earth. People shall worship him, each one from his place, indeed all the shores of the nations. Now, has that been totally fulfilled? Read the verse quickly again to yourself. Has all of that been totally fulfilled? I'd say no. I don't think so, because guess what? It doesn't all appear to be there. People shall worship him, each one from his place, indeed all the shores of the nations. In other words, everyone. Hmm. Is everyone worshiping God right now? No. So apparently there will come a time, and we know there will, there will come a time when the whole universe, all the nations of this earth, will indeed worship God. Sin will be over and past brought to an end. And then this would be fulfilled, wouldn't it? So that would be a day of the Lord that is a transitional time that all the little ones are symbolic of. But this would be the ultimate one. Now, the key thought says judgment is coming, but grace and mercy are still available for those who earnestly, what? Do we get something we don't look for? Does God give us a lot of stuff that we don't look for? We need to, we need to seek it according to the key thought there. All right. We, we have our, a part to play. The are there things that you get without seeking? Yes. Like what? Sunshine, rain. Sunshine, rain. Air, air to breathe. Okay. These things God gives to all of us. But are there some things that you get only if you seek it? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we need to make a difference in those. I was reading something yesterday. I was doing devotion for sure, and it was, uh, it was out of the great controversy. It was talking about like gold miners and, and stuff, and, and, or silver, or whatever. They're mining, and they're, they dig for, for uh, years or months or whatever for, just to get a little vein of uh, gold or uh, silver or whatever, you know. And they put all that work and all that energy just to dig, just to get that little little vein there, you know, it's, it's something like digging from in the Bible, uh, compare that to, if you want to learn, and I learned a lot yesterday, just reading about a few chapters out of the Great Controversy, where you just, the more you read and dig into it, the more you learn, and the more you realize why things are like they are. So the bottom line is, like the mining, there's things available whether you go looking for it or not, like what? Dirt? 
the rocks. You could plant a plant in the soil and it grows. You didn't have to go looking for it. It's there. But there are things in some places that are worth a lot. That if you can find, you become wealthy. And God uses that illustration in Scripture. You know, the pearl of great price. The guy that was out tilling his field that he had rented and found the, the treasure. He went and sold everything he had because of the value. The value of that one treasure was far greater than everything he owned. So everything he owned could be replaced once he got the treasure. Is that true of salvation? Many times over. Many times over. Have you ever said God is an awesome God? Uh, it's interesting here in our verse, it says the Lord will be awesome to them. Yeah, he's going to be an awesome God. Awesome is a big word. Because really what he's describing in this verse in Zephaniah 2.11 is that God is going to be so awesome as a God that he is going to remove every other God out of its place. So whatever man has worshipped, whatever Satan has set up for himself, God is awesome, great enough that he's going to remove them, disrupt them. Now, go back to the great controversy theme in your mind. What did Satan tell God he wanted to do and was going to do? What great thing was he going to do? I will be like the Most High. What's that like? I don't think anybody knows. <laughs> we don't. It's beyond us, isn't it? Well, well we know that he's, he's, um, you know, he's awesome. He's merciful. He's kind. He's very kind to us, and we don't really appreciate a thing as much as we should. But he's very, very good to us on a daily basis with everything in our lives. And, and the reason that we don't appreciate it, one of the reasons, is because we don't know how good he is being. No. We're receiving things that we're not aware of, and he's doing things to help us to protect us that we're not aware of. So we can't possibly appreciate as much as we should, even if we're trying to. But you see over here, as you read Zephaniah along with the rest of them, <clears throat> he's showing you something else. He's showing you that he is also a, 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 a just God, and he also distributes punishment as well. I mean, he maybe he's loving, He's giving people a, an opportunity to repent, and some of them have, according to this. He's sending to save a remnant of his people of, of Judah here, okay? Now, when you look at what's going on here, and, even, and what these people are doing, I relate that to exactly what's happening today. So the people that are called out, and I don't, I, I say that on, on, only because I, I don't use the word Christian because, but we won't go into that, okay? But anyway, the, the, these these people today who have been called out and call themselves Christians, okay, they are doing exactly the same thing that's been happening over here. And the signs, I think, are here today as well uh, as to what's happening. I don't know if you've ever seen the tape called Isaiah 9-10. Isaiah, and if you ever see it, it relates to exactly what's happening today with our government and the blessings that God bestowed upon this country and how we have let God down and we are going down the same path that these people are over here. So you can make a relationship with, with, uh, with, with Jonah, who was the exception because in that particular case, Nineveh, Nineveh repented. Mm -hmm. and, and so here, here you could have had a, a day of the Lord that you're talking about right now that is never referred to as a day of the Lord, but it was the repentance that saved them, okay? This is just the opposite. This one is over here. Okay, go to Sunday. Now, let's, we're going to take this piece by piece now and, and look at some of the elements of this day of the Lord. All right? On Sunday, what is the title? What's it called? A Day of Darkness. A Day of Darkness. Really, what it's saying is, and I kind of pinned in here, it's doom for someone. It's a day of doom. 
So you might want to add those words in there. Day of darkness, but it's a day of doom. On Monday, the humble of the land, I asked the question, uh, or it's about what we should be. So we have a day of doom here. The question that God asks is, what should we be? If you go to the next day's lesson, it says a corrupt city. It's really a description of what we are. Now notice, we're going from doom to what we should be, but instead what we are. And then on Wednesday, God's greatest delight, it's what God wants for us. You, you see the progression of what we're going to be studying here, what we're looking at? And then it's God's answer to justice. So first of all, let's go back to Sunday, a day of darkness. It's a day of doom. And of course, it's doom for who? Because on the day of the Lord, you really have two groups of people. So as this day of the Lord approaches, you have for some, it is doom. What is it for those that it is not doom for? If we divide the people into two groups, there's those that it's doom, and for the others it's... Spirit or saved. It's what? Either spirit or saved, and as far as this goes over here. I'm going to use a long word, long form of one of the words you used. For one it's doom, for the other salvation. For one it's an end, for the other it's almost a beginning. Right? So the wicked are here. It's doomed for them. Those that have been righteous, it is a day of salvation. Now, one of the reasons that I asked Jeff what he meant by salvation earlier on is because we can use the word salvation in two distinct ways. Salvation is what happens when I receive Christ into my heart. At that point, I receive his forgiveness and I receive the grace of His presence and power to live the way He wants me to live. How long did it take you to realize that? To realize what I just said? What you just said. Yeah. I realized it early on, but I didn't understand it the way I do now. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure exactly how you're asking, but I believe that salvation is something that grows on us. God teaches us more and more of what that is. Is that what you're yeah, yeah. coming to? Because a lot of people accept it, but they don't understand it. Exactly. And as they read and study and the Holy Spirit reveals it to them. It goes back to what she was saying about appreciating God's goodness. Mm -hmm. How can you appreciate something you're not aware of? If we don't understand what salvation is in the first sense, because see, there is a salvation that takes place back here before the day of the Lord. Let he who is holy be holy still. Let he who is unholy be unholy still. Let the wicked keep being wicked. And let the righteous keep being righteous. They have become what they're going to be. He says, I can't change them. I have tried. I have done my work back here before the day of the Lord. And I can't change them. They have said no to me. But then there are the righteous that have said yes to Jesus. They have received, if you'll notice, I carefully worded what salvation is. That salvation is surrendering to God, receiving His forgiveness, and the power of His grace to live without sin. And so we've received that grace of power back here. His grace isn't forgiveness alone. The major part of His grace is the power to transform the most horrible thing that has ever entered the universe and change it to the most beautiful thing God has, which is character. It'll all 
lands right here, won't it? Yeah, it lands right there. But if you can go, if you can get on the grace of God, way on back there, Let, let's let's do this. They're trusting in themselves. They're not trusting in God. They're trusting in themselves and their ability to do things. It isn't a problem all along. That's true. Let's. I'm going to move this just slightly, just to make it a little more obvious here. Day of the Lord. Okay. So here's his day. For one group it's doom. For another group it's salvation. Before the day. After the day. So here's an event. There is a salvation, we said, that takes place before the day. There is a development that takes place in these people that happens before the day. Each day is symbolic of the end. Each day that I reject God and do not receive His blessings is symbolic of the day I lose them all. Each day for the saved that they receive Christ and His power and His grace is symbolic of the day they transition into a life with all of it with none of this. And these who are preparing for the day where they end it and they lose all of this. Interesting. Which is to say, if this is time period and it's much longer than we have room to put on our board and it goes back 6,000 years of sin, We have had a cohabitation of two things that the day of the Lord is going to end. What is that cohabitation? And where? Sin and righteousness. Where does it dwell? Here. It's, it's cohabitating for the last 6,000 years. Where? Here on earth. Where else? Uh, well, it started in heaven. Nowhere. It doesn't exist anywhere else, does it? It started there, but for that 6,000 year period, basically, we're saying it cohabits on earth, didn't happen anywhere else, hasn't happened any other time. It's only been this earth where sin cohabits righteousness, which is to say that God is here, God does have some control, and so does Satan. They cohabit. Often our human confusion between God and sin, between good and evil, is because we don't know who brought which one, because it coexists. Prior to that, the angels had no clue what sin would be because they'd never seen it before. Guess what? After the day of the Lord, there's not going to be any question as to what sin is because they've seen it. But there won't be a taint of it anywhere. As it started, had its beginning, it's going to have its end. The difference is, nobody in the universe but God knew before what these two were. They only knew one. They knew God. After the day of the Lord, the universe will know both of them, but only experience this one again, as they did before. So that, that concept of the great controversy focuses here is brought to a conclusion here. Do you see why he calls it the day of the Lord? Now, we're not saying 24 hours. We're not saying 30 minutes. We're saying the time is coming when God transitions from a world of sin and righteousness combined mixed cohabitating and the sin part is going to be eradicated and only God's righteousness will live in the universe after that. So now going back to a day of darkness. Well, yeah, it's a day of darkness. It's a day of doom because for all of the wicked up here, this is the end. 
So the day is both a day of endings and a day of beginnings. Take birth, for example. Have all of you ladies had, had children? Okay, gotcha. Is it a wonderful day you'd like to go back to? You'd like to go through the labor pains again? Anybody like to do that? Only if it meant giving birth to a child, right? <laughs> You'll tolerate it because of what it gives you. Hasn't God been tolerating sin? Hasn't he? But he tolerates it because of what he's going to get. And those that can't figure that out, that stick to their sin, that stick to their own choices, stick to their own will, stick to their own desires, the day's going to come. As hard as it is for God to do it, God will destroy them. Now, Zephaniah, verses 1 to 4. This is under compare in Sunday's part of the lesson. Zephaniah 1, 14 to 18, with Joel 2, 1 to 11, Amos 5, 18 to 20. He says, when read together, what picture do they present about the day of the Lord? Take your sheets that I handed to you. And I want to show you something that I've been enjoying doing uh, from time to time. It, it's, it's a lot of fun. This is just the King James Version. That's all it is, straight out of the Bible. I just printed it on a sheet. Uh, uh, New King James, I'm sorry, New King James. It's up there in the top right-hand corner, N-K-J-V. And I just put space enough that you can write between the lines. There's space on the left so that you can write over there. Gives you plenty of room to write. I like to take a book of the Bible, put it on paper this way, and then just pray and meditate, read it, study it, and write notes. So I'm going to read out loud to you, but I want you to take your pencil or pen and write in what it means. Now, I'm going to prompt you as we go along to kind of help you. Uh, so I'm just giving you an example of how you might do a worksheet for study. Okay, this is Joel, chapter 2, verse 1. Blow the trumpet in Zion. Okay, what does it mean, blow the trumpet? What is he saying? Take your pen and write it to the left underneath. What does it mean to blow the trumpet? What is he saying? It's symbolic, but what is he saying? Sound a warning. Sound a warning. Okay, that'd be a way of putting it. Actually, that's the exact words I wrote down, Jeff. Sound a warning. Okay. In where? What does it say? In Zion. What is he saying? Where is Zion? Symbolically, what is Zion? It'd be God's people. Okay? God's people. The people that God chose. Okay? It's the whole group of God's people. Does it mean just the saved of God's people? Is it a remnant in God's people or is it God's people? You hear a lot of people argue about this kind of stuff, so well, actually, take it lightly. Those people who keep the commandments of God are God's people. In one sense. In the other sense, God chose Abraham and then promised to bless his seed. So in that sense, all of Abraham's seed was God's people at that time. So that would include those that received him and those that did not, in that sense. So it's used in different ways, so we have to be careful. Okay? He referred definitely to Israel as, as his people. He specifically said they are my people. Israel are his people. And that include the righteous and the wicked among them. Okay, let's not, let's not go there, no. This, let's keep it as Zion. Zion is God's people. And I'll show you something here. It says, and sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Where would the holy mountain be? It would be his government. Okay, it's the same as Zion. With a little different innuendo. Remember the writing technique of the Old Testament? You'll see it heavily in, in this book. You, yes, you make a statement and then you repeat it with different innuendos, okay? So it adds to it, but it's still a repeat, okay? Notice it says, blow the trumpet, sound an alarm. Same thing, but different. 
What's different about blow a trumpet and sound an alarm? What's different? I don't think there's anything different than that. I think just the way you're presenting it. I mean, the blow a trumpet is the sound of the alarm. Okay, so blowing a trumpet. One is the act and the other is what it represents. Okay. okay, blowing a trumpet could be an alarm, but it doesn't have to be. They blew the trumpets for a call to worship. They blew trumpets for many different purposes. So the first one, blow the trumpet, doesn't tell you it has to be an alarm. But the repeat of it does. So the repeat gives you the context. It, well, it's more specific. Say, first he's just saying, uh, give a message. Okay, we're giving a message. Tell everybody. Blow the trumpet. Okay, because that's what the trumpet was for. Yeah, they called it a shofar, and that was also on, on a Sabbath to call the people before the ceremony began. They blew this horn. It's a ram's horn, so it really yeah. So that's not an alarm, but it was a call to all the people. Okay, so, but when it says, and sound an alarm, uh, this is not a call to worship in, in that sense. It's an alarm. Something dangerous could be an alarm that the enemy's coming. In this case, is not God an enemy of these people? So the enemy coming to the wicked is God. They have no greater enemy. No more than the righteous have any greater enemy than Satan. Okay? So now you might want to write there, then sound an alarm in my holy mountain. In whose holy no, mountain? That would be his nation. Be God. Okay, so God's holy mountain. God's what mountain? Holy. Holy. So certainly they belong to him. They're holy. And mountain. What is mountain? How is mountain very often used in scripture? What does it mean? It's a, like I say, it's a government is what it is. It's a government uh, as, I, as I understand. Okay. It's a government. It's also used very often as places of worship. The high places, the mountains, the forests, the trees. You watch, and these are often used as a place of worship. So it's the same basic idea that you're giving because it's now God's people, the government of their people, it's that group of people, but they're also a holy people that are supposed to be dedicated to God worshiping Him. Then the next part of the verse. Let all the inhabitants of the land, what? Tremble. What does that mean? Be afraid. Look out. Something magnanimous is going to happen. Be prepared. It, it gives you... Kind of a, a warning. Well, that's what we heard in the previous phrase. So let the inhabitants of the land. So are we talking about just the priests here? No. No, it'd be every individual in God's Zion, in his holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble for the day of the Lord is coming. Now he's specific about what to tremble about a time period, and something that's going to happen. Now, why would you need to tremble? Why would you sound an alarm on this day of the Lord? What is going to happen that you're in danger of, that you're going to need to prepare for? What is God going to do on that day? What does it sound like to you? We know it's spiritual. It's not going to be who gets on the train and who gets left behind. It's going to bring the wrath down on those people. It's a judgment day. Yeah. It's a judgment day. So the day that God starts to rule or take control, then he goes on, for it is at hand. It is at hand. A day of what? Darkness. Darkness and gloominess. Gloominess. So amongst all the things that are going to happen to some, it's not going to be a pretty day. It's not going to be the best day of their life. A day of clouds and thick darkness, light and dark. How does God use those terms scripturally, spiritually? There, there are several ways that he's done this. 
what, what would it be in this context? Truth and error. He often refers to the men, uh, people of darkness, living in darkness, be the children of light. He refers to himself as the light of the world. In the New Jerusalem, there's no need for the sun because he is the light. Okay, on and on. Yeah. So we see that reflected here, don't we? Have you heard, he also done this with Israel when he brought them out of Egypt. He had, yep. he had the, the cloud by, by day exactly. and by night. So he but did it uh, literally because they needed it, but used it then symbolically to help them understand the spiritual aspect of that. Good point. So it's a day of darkness and gloominess for some, a day of clouds and thick darkness. So for some, the day of the Lord is spiritual darkness. They're going to be shocked. You remember when Jesus was talking about the second coming? He says, every eye shall see him. There shall be weeping and wailing and gnashing of teeth. Why? Why would people be weeping? Because they're not prepared. But don't they know that? But they should. Do they, those that are crying, do they know they're not prepared? Yes. Then why are they weeping? Because they didn't. Prepare. They know they're lost, number one. And, and, and the ones that are, are gnashing their teeth at those that think they should have been saved in order. There's the problem. There's the problem. When we think we're okay, we're not crying. But when it suddenly dawns on us that we're not getting what we thought we had, then there's sorrow. So in other words, back here during this time, before the day of the Lord, these people call themselves Christians. You see the problem? As he pointed out earlier, a lot of people in Christianity think they're fine Christians. What do you think you are? Are you today, if you are one of these, are you going to be surprised on the day of the Lord? No. no. But if you really haven't done it right, won't you be surprised? Because you're going to think you did. And a lot of people have heaped up for themselves preachers preaching what they want to hear. Other people have convinced themselves of what they want to believe, and they just hang on it with great tenacity. No matter what anybody says, you can't change their mind because they want to believe what they want to believe, and they have satisfied themselves that they are wonderful Christian people, even though... They aren't doing this, or they haven't followed that. And so we build up, these people build up for themselves a system of religion that gives them great comfort, but doesn't follow the light. Are you with me? And so now, when it becomes a day of doom, they thought they were Christians. They convinced themselves they were Christians. They convinced themselves they were right and everybody else was wrong. And suddenly, when Christ in His glory appears, they're not prepared to see it. And conviction hits them. Yeah. But during the time of trouble, the of is during the time of trouble, will we not question our salvation, maybe, some of The righteous, from what Ellen White says, oh yes. The only way that we will make it through this time, the righteous will make it through the last time of trouble, this little spot right just out of that line. The only way they'll make it is just simply trusting. Cannot look at anything outside of themselves. Everything appears to be against them. It appears that God has hidden himself from him. He is not protecting them. In a lot of cases, it'll appear that way. Some will be in the prisons. Some will be in dungeons. And you just say, but I did what God asked me to do. I surrendered myself to him every day. I gave him my heart. I will be faithful. And the oil of the Holy Spirit that we have saved up will be enough oil to carry us through. And those that haven't are going to go out looking for it, and it won't be anywhere to be found. Because it's a what kind of a day? Dark 
day. Day of darkness and gloom. This day, yeah, but so will that little period just before it. The, the five foolish virgins went out to find oil. Guess what? The day arrived before they found the oil. All right, let's go a little further. Like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. Interesting analogies here. Morning clouds, that mist, that haze setting way down over the mountains. You can't see the mountain. Now, what is the mountain a symbol of? The high places? Spiritual worship? It's hidden. The spirituality is hidden. Truth is hidden. Like the morning clouds spread over the mountain, a people come great and strong. So the people come great and strong. Ah, now we have a people coming that are great and strong. Who would they be? They're, in this particular case, I don't think they were invaders coming into the land. Okay, but if this is a people great and strong coming, the like of whom has never been, nor will there ever be any such after them, even for many successive generations. Apparently, there's a people coming, it sounds like to me, there's a people coming to teach something that they're not prepared to hear, but it will be carried out. That's my thinking. Morning arrives, but sin is obscured, isn't it? But to those that have truth, is it hidden from you? If you have truth, is it hidden no, no. by what happens? No, you still know it. Uh, let's get on to verse 3. We don't have time to do all this, of course. A fire devours before them. What is a fire? Now remember, this is talking about these people that came that were strong, uh, stronger than has ever been before. Uh, you think of the power of Elijah when you think of these people coming with great strength and power. People that have strength that's never been uh, like people that's never been before and never after. What kind of people would it be that have that kind of power? That God would say there will never be anybody stronger than them. What people would these have to be? Who? People that went through this were infected with sin, but had the grace of God and overcame it, those people are more powerful spiritually than those that have never experienced it. So as you read verse 2, these people that are coming are a people sounding a warning. Remember he says, sound the alarm, blow the trumpet. Who's doing it? The people that have righteousness, God sends them to prepare people so that they won't have doom. He's sounding an alarm. Change. Get on the right side. And then you see in verse 3, because the day is coming, you're sounding the alarm back here, the day is coming, and here's what this day is going to be. Verse 3, a foul, well, this is still back here, a foul fire devours before them. What's a fire spiritually, scripturally? It's used in a refining process. Refining process. In refining, we can say it's purifying. That's what refining is. It purifies. So if God sends fire, he often refers to that as trials, troubles, temptations. It purifies the righteous. It makes the wicked more wicked because it emboldens them. Okay? So a fire that is the purification of God devours before them the judgment of God. Behind them, a flame burns. Now, that's an interesting illustration. So here goes God's people. Here goes God's truth, His message. Before them goes judgment. Fire, purification fire. Behind them is still burning a flame. Hmm, interesting. Behind them, there is nothing left. There's no sin to follow after the day of the Lord, is there? When we go to heaven, when eternity rolls, is there sin following along? No. The flame of destruction is still there, if you want to put it that way. We know it goes out, but that's the symbolism here. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them. It's been purified. 
all eternity, is going to be pure before them. Behind them, a desolate wilderness. Sin is over. It's not part of the new life. Surely nothing shall escape them. This message that God brings to the world, there is no sin going to escape that and go on into heaven and eternity. Their appearance, referring back to these people that has this power, their appearance is like the appearance of what? Horses. Are you aware that the only time, that every time horses is named in the Bible, every time, to my knowledge, it's in reference to war. Every time. So here's a war. Their appearance is like the appearance of war. All right? And like swift steeds, they run. How do they run? Slow? Swiftly. This will be a work that is done quickly. And, and so on. With the noise like chariots, other mountain tops, over mountain tops, they leap. And so on. Mountain tops, again, we're back to the mountains, uh, places of worship. They just right over them. Nothing can stop God's truth from conquering sin. Okay, let's move on to Monday. Uh, let's catch a couple of high spots here in the next days and, and see what we have. This is about what we should be. In Zephaniah 2, 1 and 3, we see the prophet's call to repentance. That's what this people is doing that we were reading here. They're bringing a message of repentance uh, God's truth, trying to prepare for the day of the Lord so that there wouldn't have to be people experiencing the doom. So it's making the choice between which way this day will be to you. Now in the second paragraph, there at the top of your page on Monday, it says, with the words, seek the Lord, Zephaniah is encouraging those who humble themselves before God to hold firm in their faith the prophet teaches that to seek the Lord is the same as seeking righteousness and humility. Mark that last sentence I just read. Notice what that's saying. That is powerful. That any time the Bible is referencing seek the Lord, get to know God, uh, find my truth. What he's saying is, understand my character and develop it for yourself. The words it uses here is seeking righteousness and humility. What two things are we actually saying when we say righteousness and humility? What is righteousness? Right doing. Right doing, which would be the character of God, right? All right, if we have the character of God, doing what is right, living properly, what else do we need to do that because we have some of this in us? What do we have to eliminate so that we can be here? What's this word? Oh, humility. Humility. So we need to be humble because we're putting down the sinful nature. Is God humble? Sure. So anything other than humility isn't like God anyway. But the problem is this right here destroys this. If you have this, you will have this. The only way to pervert character is quit being humble. If you are humble, it's easy to have character. Satan's problem in heaven is he lost his humility. In losing his humility, he perverted his character. Isn't it interesting that we in the church talk so little about humility? Interesting. Jesus talked about it a fair amount. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Humble. 
you take very spirited people. You know what I'm talking about, just very active and excited and all this stuff. Many times it's all about them. But you look at the Bible's usage of this, poor in spirit, humility, is talking about a quiet and reserve of oneself to be able to observe, assist, and help others. Self is really put in the background so that others are the focus. What if God spent 50% of his time telling you how great and wonderful he was? Look at me, look at me, look at me, look at me. Well, he wouldn't have, you wouldn't have time to really see the truth of what he really is because you'd be looking at some artificial part. When you, want, you and I want to know what God's character is like, what do we look at? Not what he says about himself, but what he is. Now, again, what did God call himself? What name did he give to Moses? What is his name? Adonai. Remember what he gave to Moses? When they ask me, well, who sent you? He says, tell them, I am. Not, I do. I am. Now, if you really want to know what I am like, humble yourself and watch. And watch. Interesting. Well, let's move on. Let's go to the next page. So the seeking, you remember from this, the seeking is to seek his righteousness and his humility. His righteousness is his character. His doing right, that's his character. What is the glory of God? Talked about this last week. What is God's glory? It's one of these words up here. There aren't too many. It's his character. The glory of God is his character. What is character? But it's what makes up who we are. Okay, so it would be your... It makes up who we are. Okay. Jeff, what would you say? Uh, the word character, I mean, it sounds sort of strange to say your characteristics, but it's the things that make you who you are. So that's going to include your choices, your attitudes, the, the choices that you make and how you deal with certain things, like, for example, the good and the bad. How do you deal with that? You know, some people say, you know, we, we love the righteous and we love the sinner, but we hate their sin. But then we never get around to really loving the sinner because we're so affected by their sin. God's character can separate that. He loves the person, period. End of story. Tuesday, a corrupt city. Now, this is about what we are. Here Zephaniah was talking about what God's people are. Now again, he's using the, the broader circle of God's people. He's not talking about any particular person or individual, but God's people. So here he describes what we are like. Was this a pretty picture? The people of God in general, was it a pretty picture at the time of Zephaniah? No. What was it like? Describe it. At the time of Zephaniah, this that's, a, that's what this is all about. The fact is that people, people were wicked. They were going against God's uh, commandments. Uh, uh, this is the reason why God wanted to pass judgment on them and why he wanted to uh, destroy them. That's why he was sending the alarm, because they were about to be destroyed. They were heading into doom, weren't they? Absolutely. They did not have humility, and they certainly didn't have the character of God, did they? Oh, no, no, exactly. Now, again, we're not talking about every individual, are we? We're talking about collectively as a group. And God has always had his remnant. Now on Wednesday, here Zephaniah talks about what God wanted. Well, we can summarize it right here. He wanted them to be humble. He wanted them to have his character. God was quick and willing to forgive. God loved them deeply even though they were about to be doomed, he still loved them. How can you prove to me? Now follow me. If God loves them so much 
And he goes out and sounds the alarm and blows the trumpet and, and warns them, you're doomed, you're doomed. Where do you see love in that? Aha! You put your finger right on it. If he didn't love him, he wouldn't have bothered. Have you ever been driving down the road and seeing somebody starting to weave, and then they straighten out, and then they weave, and you think, they're falling asleep. They're going to kill themselves. Now, you've got two options. Just ignore it. Say, let them kill themselves. Or try to do something. Is there much you can do? You know, you got a little car and there's a great big 18-wheeler. What are you going to do to wake up a guy driving that big 18-wheeler? First of all, you pull up beside him and he's up there you can't even see him. Up in the driver's seat at least. There isn't much you can do. You might blow your horn, hope that wakes him up, uh, you know, something of that nature. But that's kind of meager, isn't it? Compared to his problem. Well, God sounding the alarm to a sinner who has completely rejected him isn't much either. It's the only thing God can do. That's all he can do. So he does what he can. And the fact that he gives them the warnings, the fact that he does sometimes allow calamities to happen is because he loves them and he's trying to wake them up. That's proof that God loves them. Otherwise, he'd just say, let them go. Don't even tell them. Don't bother them. All they'll do is throw it back in my face anyway. So just leave them there. On Wednesday, I wish we had some time to really spend on this. Zephaniah 3.13, and it's quoted here. It says, they will eat and lie down, and no one will make them afraid. Now, we're talking about in this period of time, aren't we? After the day of the Lord. I want you to notice something here. Uh, write down Ephesians 6.11. If one of you remember what that is, Ephesians 6.11, what is that verse? Anybody remember? Uh, sounds like some uh, armor of God there. Yes, it is. That's it, David, or Jeff, that's it. Put on the whole armor of God and do what? Put on the whole armor of God and stand. Zephaniah 3.13, they will eat. When you have the armor of God on, does it mention eating and drinking and enjoying the beauties of life? Does it mention that? No. Not at all. It says they will eat, lost my place here, and lie down. What does it say when you put the armor on? You do what? Stand. Stand. Here it says they will eat and lie down, and no one will make them what? Afraid. Ha! Huh. In one case, he says, stand up, put on the armor, stay alert, don't take of the bounties of life, just stand. Now that stand means hold your ground. You've gained a victory, don't let it go. God gained the victory. You've accepted it in your salvation when you surrendered to Him. Now He says, put on the whole armor of God, put on all the defenses, know His Word, be surrendered to Him, put on all of the armor of God, and stay in your place. However, after the day of the Lord, and God has rescued His people, now you can eat, now you can lie down, and you don't have to worry about an enemy. That's after the day of the Lord. How much of this part should we be doing here? It's pretty sobering, isn't it? Is this period of time of eating and enjoying and resting? Put on the armor of God and stand. This day is coming. Then we can enjoy living. Too many of us too many of our world today, including the Christians, want to enjoy life here. And they're going to find themselves in this group because they didn't pay attention to be in this group. We're busy enjoying life. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we love to enjoy life.
But in order to have eternal life, we realize that we must be listening to the alarm, listening to your voice, surrendering to you, having great humility, and taking on your character. Bless us, God, with your Holy Spirit, that we may be empowered to be like you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.